Okay, students, in our latest installment designed to dazzle your minds and prepare you better for standardized exams, today we'll be talking about oxidation reactions. After today's lecture, you should know the reagents and be able to predict the products of the following reactions. Potassium permanganate, acidic chromate, and MnO2 oxidations. Alkene epoxidation. The treatment of epoxides with Grignard reagents. The treatment of alkynes with mercury sulfate and aqueous acid. Ozonolysis of alkenes and alkynes. And osmium tetroxide oxidation of alkenes. Now first I want to remind you of something I taught you back in chapter 4. An easy way to define or at least pick out oxidation and reduction reactions. You may remember from general chemistry that a simple way to define reduction is gaining electrons. Conversely, you could define oxidation as losing electrons. An easy way to remember this is by remembering that Leo, the lion, says grr. In other words, losing electrons is oxidation and gaining electrons is reduction. Another mnemonic you can use is oil rig. Oxidation is losing, reduction is gaining. Now, During my early years of studying organic chemistry, I frequently saw professors refer to certain reactions as being oxidation or reduction reactions, but it wasn't really clear to me at the time that anything was gaining or losing electrons. As a result, I've assembled a short list of additional ways to spot oxidation and reduction actions or reactions very quickly. If, for example, you see a reaction in which a starting material gains bonds to hydrogen, loses bonds to oxygen, or loses carbon-carbon double or triple bonds, then it's very likely that that is a reaction in which that starting material is being reduced. Conversely, if you see a reaction in which a starting material gains bonds to oxygen, loses bonds to hydrogen, or gains double or triple bonds, you can be assured that most of the time that is a reaction in which the starting material is being oxidized. And now I remind you of another old reaction you shouldn't forget. If we treat an alkylated benzene with KMnO4 water or sodium dichromate, it will convert any and all benzylic carbons to benzoic acid as long as those benzylic carbons are bonded to at least one hydrogen. So if the benzylic carbon has at least one hydrogen, then this reaction will work. If it doesn't have any hydrogens on it, then this reaction will not work. So once again, oxidations of tertiary carbons do not work because they don't have hydrogens on them. Now there are other reactions that you can do with potassium permanganate or kaminophore, which I'll talk about later in this presentation. There is a subtle difference between the preceding reaction and this one where we treat a benzylic carbon with MnO2. Once again, the carbon has to have a hydrogen on it or this reaction won't work. The difference, however, is that MnO2 does not oxidize the carbon all the way up to carboxylic acid. And take, instead, it just takes up this uh, benzylic carbon up one bond uh, to a ketone. And you have to start out with a carbon that is bonded to an oxygen, in other words, a primary or secondary alcohol. So MnO2 will oxidize this up to either a ketone or an aldehyde, depending on whether this is an alkyl or a hydrogen, respectively. We now turn to chromium uh, oxidation reactions, which were first covered last semester in chapter 10. Just so you know, acidic chromates, that is, uh, like dihydrogen chromate or chromium oxides and acid will oxidize primary alcohols all the way to carboxylic acids. You can see that an aldehyde is an intermediate in this pathway, but you can't stop at the aldehyde. These chromium reagents are way too uh, reactive oxidatively, so they'll take a primary alcohol all the way to a carboxylic acid. They'll also take a secondary alcohol to a ketone. So we can take this and go up one bond to uh, oxygen, thereby furnishing a ketone. Now acidic chromates also oxidize aldehydes to carboxylic acids, which should make sense given the pack picture that I showed you on the previous slide. An aldehyde, once again, is really an intermediate in the chromium oxidation of primary alcohols to carboxylic acids. So once again, acidic chromates only oxidize secondary alcohols to ketones. So right here you might be asking, why? 
Why do acidic chromates only oxidize secondary alcohols to ketones instead of oxidizing them all the way up to carboxylic acids? The answer is because secondary alcohols only have one hydrogen attached to their OH carbon. So you see this carbon that's stuck to an OH? It only has one hydrogen on it in a secondary alcohol. Uh, therefore, you can only go up one bond to a ketone. If you start with a primary alcohol, which isn't shown here, a primary alcohol has two hydrogens bonded to the carbon. So it can go up two bonds to oxygen to carboxylic acid. Now, I want to explain this to you, showing you a rough, and I mean rough, depiction of the reaction mechanism. Roughly, the reaction mechanism of these oxidations proceeds in this fashion. We've got a secondary alcohol. You treat it with this chromium reagent, and what occurs is this oxygen gets bound to the chromium metal. Then what happens is a base, and I'm being generic here, does basically just an elimination. So it grabs this hydrogen, folds the electrons down here, and kicks off the chromium to form a double bond right at this position. That gives you a ketone. Now if you have a primary alcohol in which one of these methyls is a hydrogen, you can go up one more bond to a carboxylic acid. But if you're starting with a secondary alcohol, you can only go to the ketone and then stop. There's no additional oxidation that can take place. Now in contrast with acidic chromates, PCC is a weaker oxidizing reagent. Thus, when treated with PCC, primary alcohols only gain one bond to oxygen. So I can take this primary alcohol here, treat it with PCC, and I'll go up to an aldehyde, and I can stop at the aldehyde rather than going all the way to the carboxylic acid as I would with a hydrogen dichromate. Uh, similarly to the chromium uh, reagents, if I have a secondary alcohol and treat it with PCC, it will also go up one bond to a ketone and then stop. Here's a list of standardized type exam questions that I want you to be able to answer. What are the products of the following reactions? Why is it so difficult to oxidize tertiary alcohols? And which of the following is an oxidation reaction? Now you should know that you can also oxidize alkenes by using this kind of reagent called a peroxy acid, which produces an epoxide. Now, although I don't require you to know the mechanism for this reaction, I'll show it to you here just for your reference and curiosity. You should know that the stereochemistry of the epoxide here has to have the oxygen be cis across this bond. In other words, this oxygen is not going to have one of these be a wedged bond and one of these be a dashed bond. That just three-dimensionally doesn't make sense, because obviously the oxygen has to be on the same side as itself. <laughs> but uh, I should also point out that in this particular reaction that I've shown, because there are no chiral reagents added, this product shown right here is going to come out the end as a totally racemic mixture. In other words, I'm going to get a 50-50 mixture of both enantiomers here. Now I indicate this by showing this sign, this plus minus sign, that means that I'm showing this reagent or this product and it's an antimer implied. Also, if you happen to see bonds drawn with no wet wedge and no dash, that is all the bonds are just straight lines, that is also uh, implies that you have a racemic mixture of both enantiomers. Now one thing I also want to show you is this. This reagent is called MCPBA. It's short for metaperoxybenzoic acid. Now you don't have to know this structure, but I would definitely make sure that you can recognize the letters MCPBA as being a peroxy acid. MCPBA is a peroxy acid that is frequently used in this reaction. Rather than using a generic R group, we actually have this metachlorophenyl group right here. So I want you, once again, to be sure that you can recognize the letters MCPBA as being a peroxy acid and know that it is connected to this reaction, even if they don't give you any structure for MCPBA. Does that make sense? Because I'll probably do that to you on standardized exams. So you might ask, what in the world can I do with an epoxide? Well, if you treat an epoxide with a nucleophile, such as a Grignard reagent, you can do this. 
You should remember that a Grignard reagent acts just like a carbanion. That is, this carbon stuck to the magnesium is effectively behaving like a negatively charged carbon. So that carbon comes in here, these electrons thrust up onto the oxygen, and it gives me this intermediate. This negatively charged oxygen can then be quenched with acid to give an alcohol. Now I want to point out that these Grignard reagents will preferentially always come into the carbon that is less sterically hindered. In this example, both of the carbons are equally available. But if you had one carbon that was more sterically hindered with alkyl groups than the other, then the Grignard would preferentially go into the other carbon because it would be easier. Now let's test our knowledge with this sample question. Show me how to convert the following molecule into the indicated product. Okay, so I'm going to show you the answer to this right now. To begin with, what I do is I take my starting material, and if I treat it with MCPBA, it will generate this epoxide. Now, I've shown stereochemistry here, but technically, this is a completely achiral reagent, so I'm going to get both enantiomers in a 50-50 mix. If I have this compound right here, which I've redrawn over here, and I treat it with a Grignard reagent, the Grignard reagent effectively acts just like a car negatively charged carbon. And the negatively car charged carbon is going to come in and attack. Which of these two positions is it going to attack? It's going to attack the less sterically hindered one, which is the one to the right. So as this comes in, electrons thrust up onto the oxygen to give this intermediate. And then I protonate that in the quench to give me my final product. Now I'm going to give you some questions. What is the product of the following reaction? How could you convert this molecule into this product? What is the product of this reaction? And what reagents would best affect the following transformation? Now back in chapter 6 last semester, we learned about this magical reaction the hydration of alkenes. Now you'll remember in the mechanism that what occurs is the electrons come out of this alkene uh, and get protonated in the acidic uh, media, giving the most stable carbocation, so the hydrogen always goes to the less substituted position. Then water comes into that and forms a bond, and then this positively charged intermediate gets deprotonated to give me the product. You'll notice that this product is the Markovnikov product, which means that the OH ends up going into the internal position. Now, Similarly, we can do this kind of reaction with alkynes. Unfortunately, we can't do it by just treating it with H2O and acid. You have to add this catalyst, mercury sulfate, which adds the re to the reaction a little bit more kick. Now, the mechanism is a little bit more complex than what I'm going to insinuate right here. Nevertheless, you can think of it as being very analogous to this reaction. Electrons come out and grab a proton from my sulfuric acid, and where does that proton go? It goes to the external carbon, because that would generate the more stable carbocation intermediate, the internal one. Water then comes in and gets deprotonated to give this. Now you should remember that this intermediate is called an enol because it has an alkene and an alcohol on the same carbon, an enol. Enols instantly rearrange to form this, which is a ketone. This process, or interconversion, is called tautomerism. Now in real life, uh, ketones always exist transiently as enols going back and forth, but the keto form is much, much more stable. Now if you treat an internal alkyne with the same reagents, there's no distinction stability-wise between these two carbons. In other words, if I protonate one, I get a carbocation that's equally stable as if I were to protonate the other. Thus, uh, after the water comes in, you end up getting a mixture of both ketone products. Does that make sense? I hope so. Now, a terminal alkyne, in contrast, is once again more stable if I add the hydrogen to the external carbon, giving the, me the carbocation internally. Water then adds in there, gives me the enol, and then rearranges to form the ketone, which for a terminal alkyne is a methyl ketone. Here are some lecture questions that will be, uh, are, are very representative of the type of questions you see in standardized exams. 
which of the reagent sequences below would convert both of these starting materials, the one here to the right and the one here to the left, into the exact same product? Next question, what are the following two molecules relative to each other? Now our next reaction is the unforgettable treatment of alkenes with ozone, which I'm sure you'll remember from back in chapter 20. Thus, when I treat an alkene with ozone, which is abbreviated O3, followed by a selected workup, the ozone saws my alkene in half, leaving me these two carbons, and then installs an oxygen onto the end of each half, giving me two carbonyl-bearing products. So yeah, you can think of ozone as kind of being like a way of sawing an alkene in half and plopping an oxygen onto the end of each double bond. Now interestingly, as it turns out, your ozonolysis product varies depending upon the workup conditions used. If we use a workup condition of zinc and water, then we cleave our double, dub, our carbon-carbon double bond and then plop oxygens onto the end just like this, no problem. You also get the same results if you use this reagent, uh, CH32S, which is called dimethyl sulfide or DMS. The problem with doing this in real life is that DMS smells like a monkey's anus. Now if we quench this kind of reaction with peroxide instead of using zinc water or DMS, then something slightly different happens. You see, during a peroxide quench, if either of these two carbons is bonded to a hydrogen, then one of those hydrogens gets replaced with an OH on each carbon. Thus, you can see that because this carbon has one hydrogen on it, I will get a product in which that hydrogen has been replaced with an OH. Over here, this carbon also has at least one hydrogen, and therefore one hydrogen gets replaced with an OH. The other hydrogen does not. And one thing, additional thing that I want to point out is that quenching with zinc water or DMS is often called or referred to as a reductive workup because you don't oxidize anything. In contrast, using peroxide uh, is often referred to as being an oxidative workup because I actually have an overall oxidation occur because I've increased the number of bonds my uh, products have to oxygen by adding an OH to it. Now this is the perfect place for us to do some problems. I want you to show me how to convert molecule 7 into 8, and then how to convert molecule 7 into 9. Here are the answers. You'll notice that this starting material doesn't look anything like this product, but if I rearrange this product and number it, you'll see that the product actually could be redrawn to look like this. This kind of looks like my starting material. If I treat my starting material with ozone, zinc water, or DMS, I saw this bond in half, plop oxygens onto the two halves, and get this exact product, which is indeed this product. Let's take a look at the answer to our other example. You'll notice, of course, that the only difference is that I have an OH here instead of an H, which I can redraw as being this molecule. Thus, if I treat this with my oxidative conditions, uh, that is ozone with peroxide quench, you'll notice that this hydrogen right here gets converted into an OH. There's no hydrogen over on this carbon, so it does not get converted to an OH, and this molecule is the very product that we are seeking. Now just so you know, oddly enough, hot basic KMNO4 does the exact same thing as ozone with peroxide workup. That is, if I take this alkene and I treat it with hot, basic KMNO4, it saws it in half and adds an OH onto each of the alkenal carbons if one of those is attached to at least one hydrogen. Does that make sense? Exact same condition, or exact same outcome as if I treated this alkene with ozone followed by oxidative or peroxide workup. The only reason that I bring this up is because it seems that standardized exam writers are obsessed with KMNO4. I don't know why, but they just love it and ask tons of questions about hot, basic KMNO4. So there you go. <laughs> now here, just so you know, is what hot, basic KMNO4 does to alkynes. If I take an alkyne and treat it with hot, basic KMNO4, does something kind of similar. It saws it in half, but remember that I've got three bonds to oxygen that I'm going to be plopping oxygens onto. So uh, that actually ends up making two 
separate carboxylic acids. And just so you know, ozone followed by water does the exact same thing to alkynes as hot basic KMnO4. Now much to your crapulent surprise, I'm sure, we still have a few more reactions to cover. We now uh, arrive at this one, the dihydroxylation of alkenes using osmium tetroxide. Osmium tetroxide, OSO4, followed by peroxide or uh, sodium bisulfate workup can turn an alkene into a vicinal diol like this. So if I take an alkene, treat it with osmium tetroxide and H2O2 workup, or you can treat it with NaHSO3, it gives me a vicinal diol. Now you should know, however, that the OHs always end up cis to each other because of this mechanism. So if I took like a cyclic alkene, treated it with these exact same conditions, I would end up with the two OHs cis, never trans. Now parenthetically, I wish to add that I recently saw an episode of J.J. Abrams' sci-fi TV show Fringe that featured an osmium-containing compound that gave certain individuals the ability to fly. Now, chemically, this is total crap, but entertainmently, it's pure gold. All right, let's put all of this stuff together. I want you to tell me what are the products of the following reactions. What products will be formed if the following alkenes are treated with ozone followed by reductive workup? What is the major product of the following reaction? And what would be formed if 3-methyl-2-pentene were reacted with hot, basic, camino 4 now that brings us to the end of today's presentation. I bid you all a good day, and most importantly, I want you to remember the following. Hershey squirts! Alright, I'll see you later.